Well, I get to preach on Father's Day, that's a gift, and then right off into the sunset. There's always a little bit of anxiety for the pastor and for the congregation when it, they go on sabbatical. For the pastor, that his key won't work when he comes back. <laughs> I feel completely free about that, by the way. And for the congregation, uh, just something new, something unknown. Uh, will we like the guest pastor more than we like our pastor? I guess that's some nervousness for me too. Uh, but Pastor Scott is retired and he's not looking for a new gig, so we picked wisely. <laughs> pastor Ray, on the other hand, is a wrinkle that we weren't expecting. Looking forward to the coming season of ministry together, whatever that looks like, together with the Spirit and with one another. So I'm preaching this message for a couple reasons. One, we've been journeying through Exodus for a number of months now, and I left us at the edge of the waters, and I felt like that was the right place to leave us, the, through the Passover, experiencing God's deliverance in a miraculous way, and His people were now entering into a new space, immediately confronted with Something unknown, unexpected, and potentially daunting, and yet God was with them in a clear, tangible way. Would they trust Him? Would they walk with Him? And so, therefore, this message, this message is all about, will we walk with God? Will we live a life with God? It's the only life we are invited to live. That's one. And two, it's Father's Day, uh, being reminded that God is our Father, vital every day, but all the more important today, as we are each filled with different kinds of emotions reflecting on Father's Day, as Rachel accurately captured, I think, a number of those snapshots for us. Some, it's more heaviness and grief and loss. For others, it's quite a bit of joy, maybe mixed in with an emotion of seeing a new season coming and wondering how it could have possibly gone by this quickly. We count our blessings and we receive let me begin also, oh, third, third reason, this is maybe one of the core messages to me in my life in the last 10 years. Uh, it's been a couple years since I've preached specifically on this, but you'll hear it often in the way that I teach and I preach. So for new ears, we welcome, welcome you here. I pray it would minister to you as it has to me. This message of the life with God, the only life that we are invited to live. Beginning and inspired by Pastor Sky Jatani, who carries his ordination with the Alliance. Historically today, he's doing some pretty neat things in the, in the podcast world, in the writing world. Some of you follow along with his devotional, With God Daily, and his simple but profound book, With, which if you haven't read, I highly recommend. Uh, he describes these four postures that we kind of naturally take toward God, which are not what we were made for and invited to. And we can confuse that we we're actually growing closer to God when, in fact, we are quite far from Him in heart. These postures can simply be described as over, under, from, and for. We can live a life over God, under God, from God, or for God, and none of them are what we were meant for. It would completely miss and misunderstand God as Father. So not burying the lead, we were made to live with God, now and forever. For many of us, we believe in the forever, the someday. We will dwell with God forever. That's heaven. That's our hope. We were meant to dwell with God now. Today, as we already prayed, God, your kingdom come here on earth as it is in heaven. Certainly, that includes here in my heart. Your kingdom come now, God. And this is the massive storyline, the meta narrative of all of Scripture, which I'll capture for us in a few moments. But many of us fail to live the life with God. Now, we take another posture almost naturally, or depending on our circumstances, our upbringing, uh, how we were taught who God was, which may have not led us any closer to a true relationship with God, our Father. So a brief overview of the postures. I encourage you to pick up the book or listen along to it on Audible. It's a good one. And try to 
see if you find yourselves, maybe in your story, in one of these postures. Which one or ones, because there's some overlap, is more natural for you? The life over God. Now, this may be pure arrogance. God, is, God only is here or there to serve me, to answer my prayers, to bless me. It, it may be the agnostic also. Oh, I believe there is a God or gods or, this, or the divine, but they're completely unknowable in a relational sense. We, we must appease them or they or him in some way. We must learn the way that the intersect of this physical world and our spirituality and the divine uh, interact. So it could actually look very superstitious. Maybe this has been you. Maybe you know these people. Grasping at all sorts of rhythms or rituals or traditions, trying to find the kind of the magic recipe of what works, what leads towards some kind of blessing or favor from the divine or from the force or the power that is out there. There's some secret life that we can enter into. It could look very religious. Uh, well, that could be in many different ways. You don't have to be a Christian or a monotheist, believing in one God, to be religious. But for our sake and our purposes, even within the church, the evangelical church, this could look like a very religious life, doing the right things and behaviors to get God to respond to our needs. That is an over-God approach. The life under God has some parallels to that, but it often it, it comes with a greater sense of fear. In a, in a healthy way, that would be reverence. In an unhealthy way, it would be fear of God and our, our, our view of God as an angry or wrathful God primarily. That's, that, that's his primary posture toward this sinful world and toward us as sinners. And therefore, a life under God is striving only to do the right things, to live the right way, to live a pure enough, moral enough, ethical enough, holy enough life that God would see us, forgive us, receive us, bless us, not judge us, condemn us, punish us. The life under God looks at suffering in, and says, there's a reason for that. Sin, hardness of heart, waywardness. Therefore, we then look at our own pain, suffering, illness, loss, when it comes, and we say, I must have done something. Where's my sin? I must repent. I must turn back to God so that he will heal me, bless me, forgive me, not continue to judge me. Some of us live in fear of his punishment now or at any moment, and certainly of the coming day. Have I believed enough, been faithful enough, done enough, the life under God? By the way, as I progress through these, I'm, I believe, they do for me, they start to sound more and more true. But that does not mean they are getting us closer and closer to God. And the reason these are subtle and so natural, one, if the, the more that one of these sounds true, it means you have been taught this or picked this up in your, in your life, in your upbringing, somewhere. For some, you're going to quickly reject one. For others, each one of them is going to sound like familiar, too familiar. That's the life over God and the life under God. By the way, in the evangelical tradition, the life under God demands that we warn everyone of the coming judgment, of the coming wrath against sin. At the extreme, it's the guy with the bullhorn down at the stadiums proclaiming wrath and judgment and vengeance unless we escape that fire through Jesus alone. And it's more subtle. It's the pressure we place upon family or friends or neighbors that they would be saved at whatever cost. We are compelled to proclaim that. On the flip side, if you're able to follow all the rules, God will see you, reward you, and bless you, and answer your prayers. Now, ping pong to the other side, or pendulum to the other side, the life from God, third posture. If you can remove all fear of the wrath of God, because Jesus has paid it all, all of our sin, past, present, and future, forever, it's covered, it's washed pure in the blood of God, in the blood of Christ. Therefore, 
We have no condemnation. We have no reason to fear God's wrath or judgment. He is there to bless. He is a good God who loves to give to us. We simply must need to walk in that and walk in that faith to receive from God all that he wants to bring us. At its extreme, it's the prosperity gospel. With more faith, I name it and I claim it. I receive it. This is mine. This is God's posture. He wants to give and give and give. He's some kind of divine genie or butler or pinata that we whack with a stick whenever we need something because that's his job for us. This is the life from God. The more subtle, and I think the more pervasive in the evangelical church, is the consumerist mindset. A life from God. I am a consumer of the things that God will bring, of spirituality, of religion, of a community, of his people. I consume that to receive that, and not necessarily material things, although it might be some of our prayers, but in an affluent society, it's more spiritual blessings, a life from God. God is there to guide me, speak to me, lead me, be for me, what I need. If I am sick, he will heal. If my kids are in trouble, I will seek him. This is the life from God approach and posture, which is not leading us closer back to him. By the way, in the life from God, what, it's not heart-level transformation that is required. It's not humility, confession, repentance. It's not fruit of the Spirit. That's the evidence of our Christian life. But it is shallow external behaviors, like attending church regularly, giving some, reading the Bible, memorizing some verses, not swearing, using the right language, praying before meals, posting verses and pithy statements online. Wearing a cross necklace, putting a Jesus fish on our car, all outward symbols, which are probably just a show because all we've done is invite Jesus into our life. This is the life from God posture. And when God doesn't seem to be blessing us enough or when hard things happen or suffering comes, we ramp up our religious behaviors, our spirituality. We find a bigger stick to whack the pinata we serve in the toddler room. We go on a mission trip. We volunteer in a local food bank or in a homeless shelter and show God that we are actually serious about this so that he will get back into his proper role of blessing us, of giving it to us. Many in the church today believe that this is a relationship with God, but it's only a relationship with ourselves and our desires our wants, our needs, that God would give and bless us. And so there's this subtle delusion going on. This is a pharisaical approach to God. When Jesus says to the Pharisees, these people worship me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. This describes the posture of a life from God, or perhaps a life under God, depending on where the fear of his judgment and wrath lies. That's three. Number four, a life for God. Now, this person knows that none of those postures are, are a right posture to God and repents of them to live their life for God. That's the highest calling, that we would bring to him our best, our right attitude, our right motives, that we would worship him passionately, that we would study the Bible sincerely, we would give generously, serve wholeheartedly, share our faith unashamedly, live morally and ethically. Sounds right, doesn't it? For me, this was the hardest one to break, to recognize that it was not leading me closer into a relationship with God, but into a relationship with achievement, with striving. I remember it at clear moments in middle school and in high school, giving my life for God fully, recognizing where I had been living a life from Him or even under Him, and saying, God, I'm now going to live my life for You. You have it all. I will show you how grateful I am of your love and sacrifice to me. But I was still trying to earn his approval in many ways. This is still not a personal relationship 
with God. Jesus describes it this way in Matthew 7, and 23. He illustrates what can happen when we replace a relationship or we never come into a true relationship with God, but with His mission, with His kingdom. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of unrighteousness. What a striking declaration and evidence of a life only lived for God, not with Him. And what's so subtle about this is all those things that I mentioned could be good things flowing out of a life with God. But when our posture is first to perform, to achieve, to show, to demonstrate, to prove, Jesus would say to us the same, I never knew you. Does that not reveal his heart to be with us, to know us, and for us to know him? If none of these are what God has created us for, then what does he want from us? The highest goal of our life is to know Him and commune with Him, to love Him and receive His love. This is the only right posture. He wants us to join Him in His work. He does not need us. He invites us. Not to do good works, to earn His favor or forgiveness or approval or attention. If we think He needs us, it already proves we do not know Him at all. God has already demonstrated His great love for us beyond what we can imagine, beginning in His very character and nature revealed through the Scriptures. We believe He is triune. He is one, yet three. One of these paradoxes of our faith, God the Father, Jesus the Son, the Holy Spirit, they are one together. In His very nature, His very name, His very character, He is a with God. And as he creates his people in his image, his likeness, we are made to be with people, to be with God. So from his character, from the picture we have of creation, where God was with his creation in that perfect Eden, walking with them, speaking to them, and that was broken. That relationship was fractured as Adam and Eve turned to walk, to live life in their own terms and their own way. And that's the storyline that continues. We've been seeing it quite explicitly in the story of Exodus. But God will not allow a distance forever. He pursues his people to dwell with them. Now in this mighty way, he will lead them in a cloud by day and fire by night. He will be with his people When the tabernacle is built, he will fill it with his presence and dwell with them again as it was in the garden. The tabernacle is ordained and decorated in beauty with growing things, with living things, with plants and flowers and fruits to show and to remind God's people that he is restoring what was lost in the garden. This is like a new garden. It will be temporary because Jesus The prophesied one, the Messiah, would come called Emmanuel. Literally, God with us. God with humanity. Jesus would come, and John says quite directly in John 1, 14, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. With us, humanity. That word at its root is literally tabernacle. Jesus, the word, became flesh and tabernacled with us. He's the new tabernacle, the new dwelling with humanity. Furthermore, Jesus commissioned that the Holy Spirit would come. As he ascended, the Spirit would be poured out and given, not only upon us, but in us. So that this became one of the most consistent teachings of the Apostle Paul, that Christ lives 
in you, dwells in you, church, and you, individual, who has received him. Romans 8, 11, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. Fast forwarding to the end. We could trace this theme all the way through. This is the meta narrative of Scripture. But to the very end, the final picture, Revelation 21. Here is our destiny. This is our vision. The vision now given to the Apostle John. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. There was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven prepared by God like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, listen to this, now the dwelling of God is with humanity. Now he will live with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. This is our destiny. This is our vision. And that's what I said earlier. That's our, for many of us, that's not new. That's our longing. That's our hope. That's our future with God forever. But now, will we walk with him? Because Jesus, Emmanuel, has come. Because the Spirit has been poured out. This is what we are invited to. The life with God. We do not seek God to be for us, the achiever of another goal. But in life with God, God is the goal. God becomes our treasure. He becomes our desire. And we seek to be restored to our perfect image in Him dwelling with Christ and the Spirit. And it seems that humanity has forever struggled to grasp this and accept this, choosing other postures instead, making God into something he has not revealed himself to be, forcing Jesus to live according to the script that we have written for him. How is it we're still missing this? We've either been greatly deceived and duped or misled or at our own brokenness and sinfulness, we've turned to the other postures that put us in more and greater control. You see the reference on the screen. Maybe you've already grabbed your Bibles and have looked at that. Luke 15, 11, 32. I am making an assumption that you have the gist of this story, this parable of Jesus down. It is possibly the most well-known, famous, and maybe the most important of all of Jesus' parables. I think it's named incorrectly in all of our Bibles. By the way, you know those headings were not original to the original story in the Greek. Those were added much later. That's why they changed from version to version, from Bible to Bible. But my guess is most of them say the parable of the prodigal son or the parable of the lost son, and it's completely wrong. A better suggestion would be the parable of the prodigal sons, plural, or the wayward sons, but that's not even accurate based on the very first phrase of the parable, and I'll tease that one for just a moment. Let's walk through this briefly on this Father's Day. This story is the picture of the gospel, according to Jesus. This is the summary in a few paragraphs of this entire book, according to Jesus. This is what it's all about. This is who our God is. And amazingly, clearly on display by these two brothers is every one of those postures that we were just talking through. Life over God, life under God, life from God, and life for God. See if you can see them, beginning with the younger son. Oh, first, first verse, verse 11. There was a man, a father, who had two sons. That should clue us into what the story is about. Who's named first in the story? The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me my share of the property, my inheritance that's coming to me. Culturally, completely unacceptable, 
out of, I mean, out of left field. But the father did so. He divided the property between his sons. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into the far country and squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in the country, and he began to be in need. Pause right there. Our postures can change from time to time as we progress through life, circumstances, situations, as we learn, as we see new things. What do we see in this younger son? First, he had been living a life under God or from God, his father. Spoiler alert. This father represents our God. These sons represent all of us. So he had been living a life from God. I'm just waiting for my inheritance what is rightfully mine. I'm going to work all these years and get it. When he couldn't wait any longer, he didn't want to work anymore, he demanded from God, the life from God approach. He moves into this far country, leaving his God, his father, and now lives in accordance to his own way, his own will, taking all of these riches that he thought was enough. He thought he knew enough about the world, but he wasn't expecting hardship or famine or the world to really be what it was like as he's now in a whole new place. His arrogance led him to live a life for a season over God, against his father, against his father's will, ignorant of it, rejecting it until he comes to a place of complete need and recognizes his foolishness. He repents of that. That's a turning, right? He turns from that way of life after he got to the lowest of all points, and he says, you know what? Life would be better back with my father. I'm repenting of my life from God and my life over God, I will come and live a life under God. I will beg for mercy, for forgiveness, to act, to just be a servant, because that would be better than this. At least I'll have what I need. I'll do anything it takes. I wonder if my father will judge me, punish me, even welcome me. So he's rehearsing his story as he comes. We see him it says, he came to himself, there's his repentance, verse 17, and says, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? I will arise and go to my father. I'll say, Father, I've sinned against you and against heaven. I'm no longer worthy to even be called your son. Treat me as a servant. So he rose and went to his father. And here's the most important part of the story. While he was still a long way off, his father saw him felt deep compassion and ran to him, embraced him, and kissed him. The son starts to try to confess and, and f- fulfill his repentance. Father, I've sinned, but the father would not allow it. And he says to his servants, bring quickly the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his hand, shoes on his feet, bring the fatted calf, kill it, let us eat and celebrate, for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He is lost and yet is now found. And they began to celebrate. That doesn't mean there won't be a time to sit down and for his son to confess and say sorry and seek forgiveness and grace and mercy. That is right. But in that moment, look at the delight of the father, the joy of the father. He runs embraces and clothes. Later, there's a time for the reconciliation that needs to happen. But now, you're mine again. You've come. Look at the posture that the son wanted to take. I will live a life under. That's better than the life I've been living. The father would not allow it. No, you are now with me again. I mentioned the title could be better said than the one we probably have, the parable of the wayward sons, because now we got to turn our attention to older brother, which is probably you and me more than younger brother, I wonder. The older son was out in the field still working for his father. He came in and drew near to the house and heard the music and the dancing and called one of the servants and said, what is all this? Oh, your brother, he's come home. And your father is throwing a party. So he was angry and refused to go in. His father came into him. He pursued him as if the father knew what was happening in his own heart. 
as if he hadn't seen it all these years. He entreated him, look. His son, the son entreated him, look, all these many years I have served you. I never disobeyed your command. You've never given me even a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. You see the posture there? It's a life, at, at times, probably a life under God, a life under his father. I will do everything you say. I'll obey perfectly. That's the way life works best. Also, probably a life from God. One day, my younger brother couldn't do it long enough. I will. I will be faithful. I will achieve the reward. My father will see me and bless me one day. Look, you never gave to me. That's why I've been living my whole life, a life from you or even a life for you. I've been living my whole life for you. Where's my reward? And here's what's striking, right? What does the father say? Son, verse 31, you are always with me. All I have is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. Now he was lost and is found. What that shows is this son, the older son, did not share his heart, his character, his love, and he would have a chance to repent, but that's where the story ends, because Jesus was teaching this parable to the Pharisees, who were the older brother. Easy to point fingers at the prodigal who squandered everything. Look at that lawless one, but look at us, who live morally, behave rightly, who are sincere, faithful, orthodox, true. And Jesus said, just because you were close in proximity does not mean you were living with God your Father. And so the right title of this parable is not about the sons at all, but about the compassionate Father. Put any superlative you want about how incredible this Father is. This is the gospel story. Look at the father. There was a man, a father, who had two sons. There is a God who has many children. Yes, some will live a life under him, over him, from him, abandon him. We've done that probably, sometimes even daily. But careful for those who believe they're doing everything for God to receive from him. We might be close in proximity but not walking with him. Will we, even to for him, and all that's led to is more striving with still an emptiness within you because you've never received God's invitation to simply live with him, to be embraced. The Father delights in you, his child. Every time you return and turn your eyes to him, from whatever ever prodigal journey that looks like, from coming in from the field to coming in from the foreign land, your Father delights in you and runs to you to embrace you. Receive that. Walk in life from that place with him. Many of our behaviors may look very similar to what we were already doing with a changed posture of needing to prove or earn or gain because he alone is the treasure to live a life with him. As we head into a new season with lots of good things to do, there's always more to do in a life for God. Know this above all else. God is already looking for us, calling to us, and delighting in us when we turn to him. He's the perfect and good father who calls us sons and daughters. May we see Jesus as he revealed God the Father, the God who is unhurried, compassionate, present, humble, meek, generous, who is the shepherd who lays down his life for his sheep, who invites us, come and follow me, be with me, 
and I will make you into something wholly new. Let's continue to draw near to him this morning, finding joy in his presence. From that posture, there is freedom to confess, to repent, to turn, to follow his conviction and live it in joy. May we respond and engage in that way.